Carol Ann Riddell and welcome to Arts in the City. We are coming to you from the New York City Fire Museum, home to some of the nation's most prominent collections of fire-related art and artifacts. There's a lot to see here and we'll show you around in just a bit. But first, the hit show The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel is in its final season. Our Neil Rosen sat down with the cast and creators to talk about the end of their critically acclaimed series. I'm really glad to be back in New York City, my home, where I have so many friends who hate me, so much family, who are disappointed in me. After five glorious seasons, the acclaimed Emmy Award winning show The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel has come to an end. For those unacquainted, Rachel Brosnahan plays a recently divorced Manhattan housewife in the early 1960s who's trying to make it in a man's world as a female stand-up comic. Women aren't funny. Your wife must have a sense of humor. She's seen you naked. The series was written and created by Amy Sherman Palladino, whose real-life father was a stand-up comic. So much of my father's career, so many specifics of his life, went into this show that Midge actually went through. I mean, seasons were built around uh, my dad's exploits and what he did. So I, I can honestly say that really Midge is 100% my six foot two bald Jewish father from the Bronx with a skirt and they're tiny and adorable and Rachel Brosnan. I'll admit that sometimes I tune people out, but mostly because they rarely have anything useful or interesting to say. Tony Shalhoub plays Midge Maisel's father, Abe Weissman, a former college professor turned New York theater critic. Tony, in addition to being an interviewer, I've also been a critic for many, many years. How did you like being a theater critic? I loved it. I, I mm. loved it. It was kind of like, uh, you know, having been an actor for all these years and being the subject of many negative reviews over the years. Um, I, I kind of loved it. I, I, I think it was, it was a kind of an unpredictable, but sort of in a way natural progression for Abe to, to don the cape and, uh, and, and, you know, kind of wax philosophical about, about playwrights and theater. Getting arrested is not a badge of honor. Getting arrested means I can't work where I want to work. People are afraid of booking me. Luke Kirby won an Emmy for playing real-life controversial comic Lenny Bruce, Midge Maisel's friend and sometimes mentor. How, how do you audition for a part playing Lenny Bruce? Do you like study his like routine? They did. They gave me the Lenny's um, airplane glue bit was one of the scenes that I did for the audition. And thankfully, there's there's a couple of recordings of him doing it, and also there's he, he did it on the Steve Allen show, so. Uh, it was a kind of a great reference in terms of, you know, you know, physicality stuff and rhythm. Uh, these kids, uh, eight and nine year old, were sniffing airplane glue to get high on. Now, these kids are responsible for turning musicians onto a lot of things they never knew about, actually. All five seasons of The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel are available to stream on Amazon Prime Video. I highly recommend it. Thank you for watching, everybody. I'm Mrs. Maisel. Thank you for giving Good night. For Arts in the City, I'm Neil Rosen. Midtown, Craig Thompson takes us inside the Jazz Gallery, an influential performing space that is nurturing both the present and future of jazz. I try to write as little as possible because I find that uh, most of the people that I play with are great improvisers. So I try to create a space where it's got, every composition is kind of like a send off to allow an opportunity to create. 
Alfredo Colon, a City College graduate, recently played at the Jazz Gallery in Manhattan, a venue located on the fifth floor of a nondescript building on Broadway. I really love how alive jazz is. I think that when you put a different group together, you play it a second time, it has a, it has a different life to it, a different, it changes the air in the room in a different way every time. Cologne is a working freelance jazz musician. On this night, he was playing two sets of music, sometimes using an electric wind instrument, an instrument he learned to play when he worked at the jazz gallery. The venue has been around since 1995 essentially a synthesizer that works uh, using breath control. So the harder you blow into it, the louder it gets. Uh, it has eight octaves of range, so you can go lower than a bass, higher than a flute. It's actually how I learned how to play. Uh, I would bring my iwi, some headphones, and for my one hour every time I was here, I would just practice between greeting people. This story is a microcosm of what the jazz gallery is, a space where jazz music is front and center and where the jazz community lives, learns, and grows. I want it the gallery to be somewhere where when the young musician get the gig at the gallery, it means something. Rio Sakari has been the artistic director and director of programming since 2000. Now that we're known as a place where musicians can, I like to call it a safe place to fail because jazz is such a thing that it's really necessary for people to experiment, not behind the closed door, but in front of the audience to find your own voice and to to learn how to connect with the audience. Cologne's gig is one of hundreds that happen every year at this venue. Over Sakari's tenure, the Jazz Gallery has nurtured some of the biggest names in 21st century jazz. VJ Iyer, the Kennedy Center's artistic director for jazz, Jason Moran, and Ambrose Akinmazur, who she met 20 years ago. I heard something special in what he does, and we became actually, he's one of my best friends. Since then, he has done, brought so many projects to the gallery. We gave him commission at one point. The gallery, a nonprofit, offers commissions, a residency program, and rehearsal space to players. Younger musicians like Cologne represent the next generation of jazz in New York. And part of what makes him special is what he learned while at City College. In academia, we prioritize grades, um, competition. It's hard to create a community that is what jazz is about, which is about community, oneness. Um, and I'm lucky enough to have gone to a school that provided that for me. For me, the primary concern is that they take the opportunity to explore um, what they're working on. So I'm not looking for them to present the finished product. For me, like so long as they are reaching for something, like okay with that. That oneness is given time and space at the Jazz Gallery. I was lucky enough to have Rio have an opening one day and she offered my band a slot. I've always associated the space not only with great music, but also great learning opportunities. It's uh, every time you bring something here, I think there's a culture of always bringing something good, bringing something different, and something that's uniquely yours. For Arts in the City, I'm Craig Thompson. New York City Fire Museum dates back to 1870. After several moves, the museum moved to 278 Spring Street, which was once home to Engine Company Number 30. The museum houses about 30,000 artifacts that tell the story of firefighting in New York, including the early bucket brigades with leather buckets, horse-drawn steam engines, a gasoline-powered pumper, present-day uniforms and firefighting tools, and an exhibit about the Great New York Fire of 1776 that destroyed 500 buildings in the city. There is also a special memorial dedicated to the 343 members of the FDNY who made the supreme sacrifice on 9-11. It also features firefighting artifacts recovered from the World Trade Center site. Also on view, a wall of patches from visiting fire departments and an installation dedicated to the heroic fire dog of Brooklyn's engine company number 203. For more information on the New York City Fire Museum, head over to nycfiremuseum.org. Next, the intersection of fashion and art, where creativity converges. Susan John spoke with fashion expert Nancy Hall Duncan about the inseparable relationship between artists and designers. From a still canvas to a moving one, 
Art has long inspired fashion. The boundaries on so many fields are being broken and become more fluid and overlap. And art and fashion are no exception, according to art historian Nancy Hall Duncan, who takes a close look at how the two fields influence one another in her new book, Art and Fashion. In the Renaissance, on the Baroque and, and all the movements that transpired, art was considered the, the moral high ground, the important aesthetic. Fashion was considered superficial. But that changed in the late 20th century. There started to be museum shows of fashion. So all of a sudden it was in art museums. I started seeing more and more artists uh, collaborating with designers. Which inspired Hall Duncan to create a book of visual comparisons illustrating the impact art has on fashion, both directly and indirectly. Something like the Keith Haring Radiant Baby dress, that's just a very direct transcription of Haring's work. And Yves Saint Laurent's perfect rendition of a Piet Mondrian using two-dimensional color planes and translating them into a three-dimensional design, which became an iconic cocktail dress and the first ready-to-wear line by Couturier. Warhol was used by Versace and that fabulous uh, dress that Linda Evangelista is wearing with all the attendant jewelry and bag and everything created by Versace was directly related to Warhol, who had an enormous impact on fashion. But frequently and more often, it is an inspirational way of looking at things. Such as designer Iris Van Herpen's innovative skeleton dress that evokes artist Paul Delvoux's painting, The Conversation, or designer Gu Pei's Ming Vase dress. If you look at the vase, the Chinese ceramic, and you look at her dress, you see concurrences of form, design, outline, color. Then there are the collaborations between artists and designers. Kusama and Vuitton was a big one. That was a real collaboration, and there have been so many of those. You get someone like uh, Salvador Dali and Elsa Scaparelli collaborating on so many things. The lobster dress, jewelry, shoes, hats were amazing. I mean, there's the uh, Isabella Blow in the Chinese house that is atop her head. It's clear that art influences fashion, but then the natural question is, does fashion influence art? Well, that's a good question. Um, I was looking for that, and I have one example in the book, which is an unexpected one. It's uh, Chanel and Picasso. One of Picasso's paintings, the one that's in the book, was influenced by Chanel's bathing suits. And so it went that way. But that's not usual, I, I don't think. Maybe I'll come to eat my words on that. That could be your next books, <laughs> depending on what you find out. <laughs> but for now, you can find art and fashion on bookshelves throughout the city. For Arts in the City, I'm Susan Jun. Bronx native. It's a brand, it's a cultural touchstone, and it's a point of pride for many in the neighborhood. Our intern, Isabel Ortiz, takes us to the store and community center that's all about uplifting its borough. We want to bring people back and provide that experience and feel something. That was very important for us. Not only sell a shirt, the how does it feel to be from the Bronx? How does it feel to be in the Bronx? Amadi's Gujon originally started Bronx Native as a passion project, a brand to embody the beauty and identity of his hometown borough. One of the things we figured out was that there was no merchandise that represented the BX, right? I wanted to wear a shirt that said Bronx Native. I had it says I love the Bronx, and I couldn't find it, right? Uh, so we took it upon ourselves. The goal? to change the narrative and negative stereotypes associated with the Bronx. 
my whole life we heard negative things about our home, our borough, uh, the BX, right? And for us, the Bronx is the most beautiful place on earth, you know? Ultimately, it comes to the people. Who are we? We're beautiful. Black and brown, immigrants, disenfranchised communities that haven't really been given the right platform to express, to engage, and to make it happen. And we wanted to create that platform that empowers and inspires the future. Step inside the shop and you'll see pieces of Bronx culture everywhere, from the floor to the walls and ceiling. What we try to do here is an authentic experience and one of the things that we were inspired by was just bodega culture. You don't have a bodega without a bodega manager, so uh, we needed a uh, Twinkie. This is the Bronx flag. It says, Nese de Malice, which means you to no evil, never give up. In Latin, the flag is something that we constantly use in our designs. We got the Vienna sausages here. I remember one of the things that we were inspired by was the bodega. The Vienna sausages, you know, for us, honestly, it's like a struggle meal, right? You grew up with it, you can put it on your rice, you can put it on your eggs, it's gonna hit, right? Yeah. So it's just here as a testament to that, uh, telling a story, all to encapsulate that bodega aesthetics and, and just that, that homey vibe. Amadis graduated from Bronx Community College in 2014, and he tells us that his time on campus was extremely important in making Bronx Native what it is today. The teachers there, and I was in the design department, um, really instilled and empowered me, you know, to really reach my potential. And it really catapulted me and really was the foundation that I needed for where I'm at now. Bronx Native has now expanded from apparel to include music, writing, and more. And Amaldi's, grateful for the opportunities he gained at Bronx Community College, now tries to use the brand to give back to the neighborhood that inspires him. We host financial literacy workshops, right? We're big on equity, we're big on entrepreneurship, right? Uh, we go to the schools, talk to the kids about creativity and teach them that they can do whatever they want to do. We host uh, food distribution here at the Bronx Theater Shop. Uh, like I said, we go to the schools, we create workshops, we have performing one-on-one -on -one classes, we have DJ classes. I like to say it is a creative ecosystem. As for the future of the brand, its founder believes this is just the beginning. And like I said, keep building up the ecosystem, continue to create social impact. Really, from the Bronx to the moon, we're going all the way up and we're bringing everybody with us. So it's gonna be beautiful. I'm Isabel Ortiz for Arts in the City. I died in a car crash two days ago. It's unrecognizable when they pulled me from the keys. No one's fault, no one's bother, no one's teenage pride or throttle. Our innocence is all the worse for fears. The other walked away alive, arms wrapped now around his wife. It's what musicians dream of, their own signature model instrument. That dream became a reality for Brooklyn-based guitarist Josh Turner. Andrew Falzone spoke with Josh about his music and his specially designed guitar. For most musicians, the thought of having a signature model instrument built by a world-renowned manufacturer to your own specifications and most individual desires is nothing more than a pipe dream. But for Joshua Lee Turner, a guitarist who rose to popularity thanks to his playing chops and YouTube, his signature model became a reality. What would that guitar look like? Like this. It would look like this. The guitar came to be thanks to Josh's ongoing collaborations with D'Angelico Guitars, demoing the company's standard models online thanks to his talent playing the instrument. D'Angelico is a legendary guitar brand that traces its roots in New York City back to 1932. Their showroom is nestled above the Flower District, where we caught up with Josh. That's a huge honor as a guitarist to be asked if you would like that. I wanted to make sure that I would be given the amount of leeway to create you know, an instrument that I really felt good about, that I wanted, uh, and they were you know, more than willing to, to kind of do what I wanted and do what I asked. 
And based on the response to the initial run of Josh's signature model, it seems that people were interested in what he and D'Angelico produced, as the initial run of 50 guitars sold out in only hours. Ryan Kershaw is D'Angelico's executive VP of product and one of Josh's signature co-designers. Making 50 instruments is, it's not a small number, but it's not an enormous number either. We didn't want to make a thousand guitars and say, you know, these are going to be available forever. We wanted to reward the people who were really interested in the project and, and give them sort of um, first dibs. <laughs> And for YouTube viewers who enjoy great guitar playing, they've had first dibs on Josh and his talent since July 2007. That's when he started posting guitar cover videos and built his channel and a steady following. But it was one video in particular, posted from his parents' house in Indiana, that set his channel on fire. Yeah, that video for me was a cover of Sultans of Swing by Dire Straits that I did back in 2012, uh, my sophomore year of college. and. It was posted to Reddit, made it to the front page, and got something like 90,000 views in a day, which was uh, totally unprecedented on my channel at that time. Because of Josh's countless covers, collaborations, and original music, D'Angelico recognized him as a triple threat with his ability to play, knowledge of the guitar building process, and ability to connect to an online audience. First of all, he knows as much about guitar making as we do, and we're the ones who work at D'Angelico. And secondly, he amassed this enormous following online and was a very prolific content creator. So what makes Josh's guitar uniquely Josh? Compared to many of D'Angelico's models, the uh, ornamentation is a lot more restrained, but uh, you know, it still has some of this Art Deco-y stuff that they, that they do really well here. It's nods to, you know, the original 1930s, uh, 40s, 50s. It's just very lightly built. It's lightly finished. Uh, and all of that just means that it, uh, it gives you more as a player. It's more responsive to touch. Josh wanted a slightly thicker neck shape because um, a lot of players like to, you know, anchor their thumb over the, the top of the neck. He was also experimenting with a wider nut width, which is, you know, brings you a little closer to a classical guitar keeping our fingerboard radius flat, it actually does maintain its comfort. This guitar was designed, I think, first and foremost with fingerstyle guitar players in mind. Um, that's my home on the instrument, is, is fingerstyle guitar. However, I also, you know, dabble in a lot of other genres and I wanted to make sure that it had that versatility. Before we parted ways with Josh, we sat down to take his signature model for a test drive. I let Josh take the lead and did my best to keep up. I'm Andrew Falzone for Arts in the City. Up next, my interview with best-selling author John Searles, whose latest novel, Her Last Affair, is now out in paperback. We chatted about the book, his childhood, and how reading changed his life. Spend some time with author John Searles and his adorable dog, Ruby, and you might wonder where his sinister plot lines come from. Yeah, people have said that before, that uh, I seem so bright and sunny. Well, I guess I get all the darkness out in my writing, yeah. so. Um, yeah, I don't know. I have, I like writing stories that have odd characters. His latest book, Her Last Affair, is no exception, and the creepy factor kicks in early with a shut-down drive-in movie theater. Her Last Affair is set primarily at an old abandoned drive-in movie theater, and it tells the story of the woman who ran it, Skyla Hull. She ran it for 50 years with her husband, and a few nights before their golden wedding anniversary, uh, he dies in a freak accident, or so we think, in the woods behind the drive-in. The book is kind of driven by these three characters, actually, yes. really, and their stories. And initially, as the reader, you don't fully understand the connection. I thought it would be a fun puzzle for the reader if, at the beginning, for the first half of the book, it's three separate points of view, three separate narratives, and you're left wondering, how do these stories connect? And then when they come together, it really ratchets up into a novel of suspense. John has written four novels. One of them, Strange But True, was made into a movie by the same name. But he explains this latest book provided a necessary escape during a heartbreaking time, 
which began when his apartment was ravaged by a fire in the building. Fortunately, John and his husband weren't home, but the damage was extensive. And so I wrote a lot of this novel uh, late nights when I couldn't sleep and staying in a hotel room, staying in friends' spare bedrooms, staying where we could as we waited for our home to be rebuilt. And, um, and so a lot of it, I think, was this was this book, Writing Her Last Affair, was my escape from a lot of um, sadness. Because also, while I was writing, my father uh, passed away in a motorcycle accident, which was, oh my which gosh, was tragic. John. And yeah, and so writing has always been an escape for me and a comfort ever since I was a little kid, because I always wanted to be a writer ever since I was a young child, and it was always my escape. And my mother has so many pictures and home movies of me. I can show you one of me walking around the house with a pad, just writing down. It was like, That's funny. yeah, and so. It was my it was my sense of kind of solace came during that hard time writing her last affair. You talked a little bit about being a kid. I read in an interview that you gave that you said you became a big reader because you would hide from bullies in the library. I was not good at sports. I weighed about two pounds. I you could blow me over. And I was immensely unpopular and the boys loved to pick on me and say horrible things about me. And we lived near the town library, so oftentimes I would go there after school and that's really where I would read and just, the li I always joke librarians raised me. I love librarians so much because I would just spend so much time there reading. And you said also your father bought you books and you yes. were, when you would drive with him, yes. is that right? My dad was a cross country truck driver and in the summers my parents would send me trucking their stated mission was to quote make a man out of me and I always joke and say they didn't get the results they wanted but they didn't make a reader out of me because my dad very sweetly in the truck stops would buy me mass market paperbacks. It was definitely a very colorful way to grow up and I'm grateful for my family and my childhood and and um, you know we had many hard times growing up but it you know I'm just feel blessed to have the life I have now. John says his next book is already underway and that so far, Ruby likes it. But she's not giving any hints. She might tell you. Yeah. You'll yeah. have to decipher the bar. I hear she can't keep a secret. <laughs> yeah. She's a gossip, that Ruby. Yeah. <laughs> she's revealing the plot of the new book. Yes. <laughs> That is our show for today. Thanks so much for joining us. A quick reminder to check us out on social media. We would love to hear from you. I'm Carol Ann Riddell. See you next time on Arts in the City.